So I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the trends and innovation in oncology. And I share um, Klaus's uh, optimism. I think you have to be an optimist inherently to be an oncologist, um, to treat such a difficult disease. But just to look back, we have made huge progress. And I really believe that at the moment, we're in a golden age of cancer drug discovery, where the uh, insights gained from huge efforts in understanding the genomics of what drives cancer and the biology of that are uh, bearing fruit in terms of the opportunities for us to develop drugs to treat the disease. I want to start with a topic that I know is going to be discussed later, which is going to be come back to the cost of cancer drugs. And there are many factors that contribute to um, drug healthcare expenditure. Um, I just point to the graph on the left-hand side, which comes from statistics from the National Health um, Service in the United Kingdom. Um, so for many decades, actually, we've had an increase in the costs of healthcare, um, including of the cost of drugs, which have gone beyond the increase in GDP. And um, there's something famous who said, when, when something is unsustainable, it will stop. Okay, um, with a variety of things. I think one of the things that's interesting is in the most recent years that that rate of increase beyond the increase in GDP, the beyond the ability, if you like, for society ultimately to pay for it, is decreasing down. But I think there's more that we can um, do um, in terms of making uh, drugs cost-effective for the treatment of patients with cancer. Um, so again, we've, we know the many reasons why it costs so much to develop uh, cancer drugs. The R&D process is, is lengthy. Um, it costs a huge amount for each individual patient in clinical trials, often uh, 100 to 150 thousand dollars per patient for a clinical trial. Um, huge. The disease itself is complex and requires complex technology um, to, to address. And one of the challenges in terms of cost effectiveness and the assessment of that, that I'm sure we'll discuss in the workshops um, later today, is about the fact that we typically get registration in late stage disease when patients have relatively short uh, outcome and time to progression and survival. Um, but the real benefit might be if you can get drugs into earlier stage disease. So I'll talk a little bit about how we might get into earlier stage disease where drugs are more likely to be cost effective um, more rapidly and more successfully. So I think there's um, three areas we can talk about that we can improve on the current situation. One is already a revolution that's already happening, and that is the advent of precision medicine. Um, so one of the things I talked about in terms of costs is the lengthy R&D process, but I didn't also talk about the actual likelihood of success. So when we're talking about the overall costs of R&D, we talk about the cost of failure, and we fail a huge proportion of the time in terms of the drugs that we develop is one of the reasons why you have to be an optimist to be in this business. Um, however, it is possible to improve on that. And we have actually at AstraZeneca over the last several years, we've seen a uh, series of improvements. And there was a paper published in Nature Review's Drug Discovery earlier this year where we showed, if we compare with the 2005 to 2010 timeframe, the most recent five-year period, we've improved from a 4% overall success rate in, in discovering drugs and taking them through to approval to 19%. Now, that still means we fail. 81% of the time, but it is a significant improvement and that will reduce um, the cost. And I think there's more that we can do. One key aspect that's improved in that background is by understanding which patients are likely to benefit from which drug. So this is what precision medicine means. By having the right testing technology, you can identify the patients that are, whose cancers are driven by a particular mutation in their, in their cancer. You've got the technologies to identify them more rapidly and therefore target those patients to them. I've already mentioned that I think there's great potential if we go into early stage disease, because um, this is the place where we've already learned over decades that if you want to cure a higher proportion of patients, you need to treat them earlier in the stage of the disease. There's greater potential to have a big difference on improving the uh, long-term survival. And then I think we also need to think about some of the clinical um, study designs. The other key aspect that we know about cancer already, if you think about the cancers that are curable, childhood leukemia, testicular cancer as examples, they're curable with multidrug combination therapies that have been developed by um, careful uh, clinical studies over time. We need, we've got so many potential opportunities for combinations, 
we need a better system and a more efficient system to evaluate those combinations. And I think there's an advent now of platform studies which, have, uh, you know, which can exist within a tumor type where different combinations can be evaluated. And we also need to think about the endpoints that we use in those studies to rapidly make decisions about which combinations are working well in which patients and why. If we put all of these things together, and I believe we can, we can improve the, the chance of success and reduce the costs of drug development. So I want to give you a couple of examples. So um, there's a drug called osimertinib, which AstraZeneca has developed and is now approved um, initially in a subsection of lung cancer. And we've talked about lung cancer. Lung cancer is one of the places where there has been this revolution in understanding the ability to precisely target um, uh, uh, the right patients. One of the most common mutations in lung cancer globally that we, we, that we can clearly see drives um, the cancer is a mutation in a gene called the epidermal uh, growth factor receptor. And there are already drugs on the market for epidermal growth factor receptor mutated um, cancers. Osimertinib is a third generation molecule designed with understanding the precise biochemistry of what happens when you become resistant to the current standard of care and designing a drug that, that targets that better. What I'm showing here is the results of a clinical trial where it was compared against the current first-generation um, EGFR inhibitors and showing an improvement both in progression-free survival on the left-hand side and also a trend to improvement in overall survival. Now, one of the myths that's out there is that targeted therapies cannot improve survival, that they improve progression-free survival, but they don't affect overall survival. Um, I'm not a subscriber to that myth. I do think that if you're targeting... Um, the right patients carefully enough and that you, um, you treat with the drug that can hit that target hard enough, it is possible to affect outcome. And I hope that when we see the updated survival data from this trial, we may demonstrate that fact. Another aspect that was really interesting about the development of osimertinib is that right from the beginning, um, we started both in uh, Western uh, countries as well as in Asia. Um, this is a mutation that's more prevalent in Asia. So 30% or 40% of patients with lung cancer in Asia have this mutation, where it's only about 10% in the West. So we started in Korea and in Japan um, and rapidly followed with trials opening in China. And you can see in this first-line study, um, almost two-thirds of the patients that were recruited into this trial came from Asia. Um, so I think it was incredibly uh, important to show that you can do trials um, in the areas where the disease is most prevalent. So that's one example of precision medicine and the ability to target. And I would say as well, just as a, if I just go back to this in one second, one of the other things that we have done with this is have blood-based um, diagnostics developed in parallel with tumor-based diagnostics. So we started with getting approval with um, a, a tumor-based test, which requires a biopsy, but not everybody can have access to a biopsy. It's not technically possible in every single patient. Um, and that means that some patients miss out on the ability to have the information about their particular cancer. Um, so by having blood-based uh, diagnostics that I'll come on to in a moment, you can increase the number of patients that can ultimately get access to the therapy. So early detection is the next theme that I want to, to talk about. If you look on the, um, the graph on the right-hand side of this, you can see um, with the advent of screening and the advent of treatments that are effective in early stage breast cancer, um, you've had an improvement uh, in, in mortality. Um, and you can see the time frame for the incidence of, of screening and that improvement in mortality. Now, not all of that is due to just the screening. You do have to have effective drugs that are available and the implementation of those effectively in multidisciplinary teams. There are many factors addressing the decrease in cancer mortality. If you look at lung cancer, in contrast, we're not doing as good a job in picking up lung cancer. That's partly because it's technically more challenging with the screening tests that are available. But there is still the potential if we could de um, detect more lung cancers at an earlier stage to have a bigger impact on the outcome of patients um, even with lung cancer. And what the graph on the left-hand side shows is the five-year survival by different stage. If you get uh, lung cancer at a localized um, setting, it is possible to have long-term um, survival from this disease. This slide also shows the potential for delivering cost-effective drugs into early-stage disease. So this is an example taken from trastuzumab. Um, and you, what you can see is the, uh, uh, the cost-effectiveness ratio, the international cost-effectiveness ratio, um, priced in 2006 dollar terms. Okay? So when trastuzumab was initially introduced in the setting of metastatic breast cancer in the 1990s, the cost per quality-adjusted life year 
was high, well above the UK's nice threshold, which is, which is um, around £50,000 um, per year for a quality-adjusted life year. So it's high in metastatic breast cancer when patients live for a relatively short period of time. But when this drug was actually introduced into the adjuvant setting of breast cancer in early stage, you can see that the price per quality-adjusted li um, uh, life year went down to $26,400. And if you then take it over the lifetime of that drug, um, it is well within the UK NICE's cost-effectiveness um, ratio. So the potential is to have drugs that are effective if you can introduce them into early stage disease. And I think you can do even better because not every patient treated in the adjuvant setting actually needs the therapy. Some of them are cured already by the surgery, um, chemotherapy and radiation therapy that they may have already achieved. So what if we could do this in more cancers? What if we could do this in lung cancer? Klaus has already introduced that the, 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 um, there's a paradigm shift going on in cancer treatments at the moment with the introduction of immunotherapies, um, largely at the moment through checkpoint in, in inhibitors, so um, things that are controlling the immune system. So there's an off switch on your um, T cells, um, and if you can inhibit the off switch, which is in, in, in inhibited in um, many different cancers by the immunosuppressive microenvironment, you basically switch on the immune system, you activate it, Cancers can be recognized and killed by um, the, the T cells. So, Devalumab um, is a, is a PDL1 uh, antibody, which is one of the examples here. And this is a trial where it was used in stage 3 lung cancer. It's relatively localized, the cancer hasn't yet spread outside of the lung and the um, adjacent lymph nodes. But these are patients whose tumors were in a, such a position or large enough so that they couldn't be resected by surgeons. So well, the standard of care is for, for combined chemotherapy and radiation therapy. And here, following that treatment, Devalumab was given for a year. What you can see is an improvement in the time to disease-free survival. And we've recently announced, actually, that this has translated through to an improvement in overall survival. So now you have um, drugs that might have both the safety profile and the efficacy profile to be used in early-stage lung cancer. Um, so this is not yet adjuvant setting, it's stage three, but there has the potential poten uh, to be used in lung cancer, and it's being tested there. And what you can also see is that whilst lung cancer screening does exist, in the United States, only 4% of those eligible for lung cancer screening actually get it for a whole variety of different reasons. If you could increase that percentage just to 40%, you might en engender a, a stage shift in the treatment of lung cancer. But there's only a point in doing that if you have an effective therapy to then give those patients. What I'm trying to show you is that we now have the advent both of the technology to do it and the potential to treat them. So, coming on to screening, um, I want to introduce um, an aspect that will be discussed again later, which is the potential for blood testing for cancer and using particular technology called circulating tumor DNA. That's what CTDNA stands for. Here, instead of having to have a uh, tumor biopsy, or an expensive um, screening test, perhaps what you can do is just take a blood test. Now, we're already using circulating tumor DNA, as I've already mentioned, for, um, for diagnosing uh, EGFR mutant lung cancer. And what you can see on the left-hand graph is that the cost of blood-based testing is substantially lower than tumor biopsies. You don't have require the interventional radiologist, you don't require the pathologist to, to, to spend all the time, it's much more cost effective. And there are some patients who can't have a tumor biopsy, so it's, it's broader access. We've shown that if you use this plasma circulating tumor DNA, it can be as effective as tumor-based testing, and the concordance rate is high, and that's what the middle panel shows, is the response rate to osimertinib by plasma testing compared to tumor testing, very similar. And we've also shown that if you monitor patients treated with osimertinib, that you can see changes in the circulating tumor DNA very quickly. So it might be useful as a tool for, for um, monitoring and making dis treatment-based decisions. But what I think is really exciting now is the potential to use circulating tumor, disease, uh, tumor DNA to actually detect patients that might benefit from, a, from additional um, treatments in what's called the adjuvant setting following initial surgery, chemo, radiotherapy. So these are data taken from lung cancer on the left-hand side and breast cancer on the right-hand side uh, by researchers who've looked for residual circulating tumor DNA following standard adjuvant therapy. And what you can see is big separation of the two curves. So those patients that still have circulating tumor DNA detectable really do have a bad outcome and might well benefit from additional treatment. 
whereas those patients that have no detectable circulating tumor DNA have a very good outcome and might not need further treatment. So this is, offers great potential for cost-effective development of adjuvant therapy and a tool that might more uh, rapidly identify those patients. So I really think that this kind of technology, whilst it's not quite ready yet, is going to be ready soon and is a very potential game-changer for oncology drug development. We're already using it for patient selection. We're already using it for detecting acquired resistance. It could potentially be used for, for monitoring and for endpoints in clinical trials. It could be used in the way I've just described for minimal residual disease and potentially even for a screening tool on its own. The technical challenges that we need to overcome is we need much more sensitive assays. We've had significant technology improvement over the last five years. I think we're going to have more over the next five. Um, we need to address the variability in that. And if we're able then to adopt this kind of testing, I think what we can um, look for is something that will be better for patients. Earlier diagnosis may be possible, less, less invasive testing possible, um, targeted therapy, precisely the mutations in their cancer. I think from a payer perspective, it's potentially better, more cost effective. Reimbursement is given to those patients that are actually benefiting because you can monitor that. Um, and for the pharmaceutical industry, it enables us to make better decisions, to have higher probability of success, um, and also to have smaller, faster trials to get into the early stage. So I think these are the kinds of ideas that might help us address the core issue and make uh, effective drugs available to a larger number of patients around the world. Thank you. I would like to uh, invite Max and Klaus back to the stage. And uh, meanwhile, also, are there any comments or questions for Susan? Yes, please. cancer um, patient and journalist from Washington, D.C. Thank you for the great information on treatment, but I was wondering if you could possibly speak a little bit to um, tracking late effects of drugs that the pharmaceutical industry is doing, and then also any um, development in terms of drugs that can improve survivorship, because at least in the States, so many of those drugs that are out there are well, either have um, a significant side effects and or are drugs that are being used off-label. Thank you. Sure. So um, in terms of monitoring long-term effects, you know, all of, our, all of the clinical trials that we talked about will monitor patients through to the um, survival uh, endpoint. And again, we will collect long-term adverse events and, you know, re report those routinely in terms of the, the, the uptake. So that's a standard part of practice today. Obviously, it takes a long time to see the long-term effects, so they're not necessarily included in the, uh, uh, in the early reports. I mean, I think what is encouraging is uh, we are starting to get drugs that, uh, where we understand what the limiting side effects burden is, that you can then design the next generation of those drugs to try and overcome that. Osimertinib is a great example of that. It's a lower incidence of rash and diarrhea than the first generation drugs because we understood what was driving that um, and increased, uh, you know, fed that back into the discovery process. Um, I think the long-term effects of some of the immunotherapy um, drugs, uh, again, we're starting to see those come through. So the very first um, immunotherapy checkpoint inhibitor, ipilimumab, that was um, produced from um, Bristol-Myers Squibb, you've seen the output now of five- and ten-year um, survival. And I think, uh, actually, um, you know, for those patients that do benefit, which are a small proportion of the total, um, you do see good uh, long-term effects. Obviously, the there are side effects, and there are significant and severe side effects in some patients. So you get incidents of immune-related adverse events, for example, which include rash, colitis, and a variety of other um, immune effects. They've been well described, I think, now in the, in the literature. Mm -hmm. I think your second point about survivorship is a really important one. Um, so we've learned for years, actually, um, you know, if you look at uh, diseases like Hodgkin's disease or childhood leukemia, that the chemo-radiotherapy combinations that can induce cure in those patients undoubtedly have long-term side effects. Um, for example, the uh, radiation to the um, mediastinum has long-term effects on the cardiac uh, you know, out outcome. Um, so I think, th again, the literature will af affect those, but I, I do think that the treatments that are currently being developed 
uh, might enable shorter duration chemotherapy. You're probably still going to be seeing them used in, in combination with chemotherapy. Might enable even lower doses of radiation therapy, potentially, if we can use them. In, and I, I think there's potential to reduce those long-term side effects over time. It takes an awful long time to do the research to make that um, follow through, though. So I think we have to continue to be patient in that regard. Patient, patience. Yes, we have a short question, because I really want to have a panel discussion sure. as well. Yes. I'll keep it short. Uh, my name is Rex Young. I'm also from the Mid-Atlantic, Baltimore, uh, from the ex-academia Hopkins side. So it's very encouraging to see pharma describing the role of cancer care from a much more comprehensive from prevention all the way through late stage disease. And, uh, but it requires a certain alignment whereby instead of just talking to the oncologist or maybe the pathologist, now you have to talk to people early on who's doing prevention and getting uh, early tissue so forth. The other thing is, when you're talking about cell-free DNA or circulating tumor DNA and so forth, very often now, who decides on a companion diagnosis, diagnostic test, because there's a lot of competitors out there offering cell-seq and cancer-seq and so forth, would pharma also be taking a much more active role in guiding the guidelines, if you will, because otherwise you're just leaving it open to confusion? Yeah, so there's a couple of good examples on that, um, that l last piece. So with the introduction of multiple drugs that target PD-1, PD-L1 checkpoint um, story, there were different tests developed by um, you know, the competitors in that race. And again, you know, when you're trying to get a drug approved, and you're trying to get approved associated with a companion diagnostic, certainly the US FDA require a set of data that you have to produce in, co in connection with your particular drug. So when you're developing that, you, you, you have to be able to get access to some of the uh, inf information and provide that. However, um, it's not necessarily helpful to have four different um, uh, you know, tests available for the same kind of drug. And so what the, the industry has done, it has come together in collaboration with sort of um, organizations like the AACR, um, that the American College of Pathologists, for example, and try and produce some standardization for pdl one testing and immunohistochemistry. And a paper's been produced on that. So we are collaborating um, across the industry to, to do that. Another example is looking now at tumor mutational burden, which is being done both on um, tumor tissue and using circulating tumor DNA. So we collaborate with multiple different diagnostic partners. Um, we assess um, the, you know, the quality of the data overall. We collaborate with those backwards and forwards. We produced, for example, a paper in the last year looking at circulating tumor DNA standardization using four different anonymized um, samples where we sent samples to and from different vendors, brought it back, showed where the issues were with sensitivity and specificity, and then worked with those technology vendors to try and improve their assays, but also to try and produce um, standardization across. So, my sense is it's a collaborative effort, and we have to keep both the immediate goals, which is to get your drug approved with an associated test that is good enough to meet the FDA's quality standard, but also the ultimate goal of what patients and, and individual hospitals are going to need to diagnose their patients. Thank you, Susan, and thank you for excellent comments and questions.